Dawn Eden from uh, the United States of America who will speak to us about purification of memory with the help of the saints, more or less. Not exactly the same. Some of you were, I think, at, at the talk she gave last night. Uh, it won't be an exact replay of that, but um, something similar or a, a, a development or a free variation on the theme. Uh, and uh, But that uh, delight will be later. I thought if I put her on first, then you'll all go home and you won't <laughs> listen to me. So uh, if <laughs> got you here, then you've got to listen to me first. Uh, so now you may recall, I hope you recall, I hope I've left you with the indelible impression that there's something called the seven deadly sins, or more precisely, uh, the eight thoughts of Vagris. And I'd just like to recap briefly before we look at, we'll have to do two in one tonight, namely vanity and pride, but I'd just like to recapitulate on what I uh, have been trying to say. And I think the, the essential idea, the, the ground idea, is that the following of Christ, uh, the living out of our faith and our baptism, does involve, it's not exhausted by, but it does involve uh, a battle with evil. And this is just an integral element in any serious Christian life, in any serious spiritual life. Uh, and traditionally, and after all Lent is on the horizon, which is a great reminder of all this, uh, this is what comes under the heading of asceticism, asceticism, which comes from the Greek word for aske askesis, which means exercise, what athletes do. And uh, the, this battle takes place, the battlefield is the heart, is ourselves as we know and I've been trying to go beyond uh, when when we think of sin we often think of sinful actions external actions um, which break the commandments and so forth but I would like to follow the monastic tradition which tries to go behind that and look at the thoughts, as this gentleman, 4th century monk, Vagrius, calls thoughts, logismoi, thoughts, not just passing thoughts, but thoughts that remain with us, that shape our mind and determine our behavior, or passions is another word that lie behind them. And uh, really, the, the great, the gospel foundation for this is in Mark chapter 7 where uh, there's been the discussion about food, unclean food and so forth. Jesus and his disciples are accused of eating, or Jesus' disciples are, e accused of eating with unwashed hands. And he says here, it is what comes out of a person that defiles. No food can defile us. It is what comes out of a person that defiles. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. And the Greek word used by the Gospel there is dialogismoi. Dialogismoi, and Evagria simplifies that, if you like, to, to um, logismoi. And he, as we mentioned, he speaks about these eight thoughts which, th with various hops, skips, and jumps, and mutations, and reorderings, and changes, ended up as what uh, we, we 
are familiar with from catechesis from of the seven deadly sins. Uh, so there, there they are. Now this is Avagrius' list. Gluttony, lust, avarice, sadness, acedia, anger, vanity and pride. Now we talked about acedia a little while ago and it's not a common word and um, actually the Archbishop of Edinburgh told me that when he was working in Rome before he got his new post, uh, Pope Francis, who talks quite a lot about acedia, he came in and gave them all a talk on acedia, and they didn't have to go and look it up. <laughs> sort of there. Uh, <laughs> they'd never heard of it. But we did, anyway, we did that rather thoroughly. We haven't done sadness. We didn't do sadness. But instead, we did what Gregory the Great slips in when he sort of fiddles around with the list, which is envy. We looked at envy. Um, and tonight we'll finish off with, with pride and vanity. But, but uh, a subtext um, is, you know, I'm trying to say, is there is so much human wisdom uh, in the spiritual tradition of the church. Now, imagine you came from Mars. You know, imagine you were a Martian and you came to Earth and you saw human beings. You know, you'd never seen anything like them before. You think, what extraordinary creatures. Uh, and, and, you know, every so often they sort of kill each other and then they, they love each other and they build things up and they smash them down. And these quite extraordinary creatures wandering around planet Earth. And I. I th and so, and if this Martian then thought, um, le let's see if the human beings themselves have got any idea of what they're about. And, and, and the Martian, you know, went into a bookshop or whatever, and he, and he found all, he went through all the philosophies, all the religions that tried to say something about the enigma of the human being. And um, I think, anyway, that if, if he was a sensible Martian, he would conclude that the Christian understanding of the human being is the best, is, is nearest, is nearest to the truth as a combination of realism and hope. Realism and hope. That it's not an idealistic vision in one way, and yet in another way it, it very much is. It's not a reduced vision, as so many of the modern ones are. Just take one bit of us and reduce us to that. No. And uh, if he was a, uh, you know, really intelligent Martian, uh, he, he, would, he would then wonder where, where this has come from. How, how, how is this understanding of the human being? Where's it come from? And he said, well, maybe it's come from this mysterious person called Jesus. And if he is true God and true man, then he is the one uh, who most understands the human being. And if we know him, then we can begin to understand us, as a famous quotation in Gaudium et Spes to that effect, much beloved of John Paul II. Anyway, so I mustn't spend time, too much time. This is meant to be a recapitulation of two minutes so we could get on to what we're doing today. But here, in, in the Catholic tradition, and, and broadly speaking also within the Eastern Orthodox tradition as well, there is a, a wonderful anthropology available to us. A wonderful understanding of the human being. Not answering all questions, because we can't answer all questions. But at least taking us a bit further than we might get on our own. And out of this, so out of this big chest called Christian anthropology, I've been pulling one little drawer marked Seven Deadly Sins or Eight Thoughts. And surely these things are quite interesting because when you're talking about gluttony, what you're talking about is what do we do as human beings with our desire for food?
you're talking about lust, what do we do with our sexuality? What do we do with our need for possessions and things? That's avarice. I don't mean all our desire for them is avarice, but that's what you're talking about avarice, that's what you can talk about. What do we do with an, our anger? There's an awful lot of it about. You know, these are really big questions, and I think there's, there's a lot. What do we do, as will come today, vanity and pride, what do we do with our need for recognition? We all want to be recognized and affirmed and praised and, and so on. These are questions I think we face on a daily basis, and to answer the questions rightly, we need the Holy Spirit, and we need the wisdom and support of the Church. And these thoughts, this stuff that these chaps you know, sitting away, weaving their baskets in the desert, were thinking about, they're not, they're, they don't just work in us individually, they affect our families, our friends, they're written large on the pages of human history. Lust, greed, anger, these are social forces, hugely so. Well, the face that launched a thousand ships, Helen. It wasn't Helen's face exactly, it was the feelings that Helen's face aroused in people that launched a thousand ships. Greed for territory or for resources leads to wars of conquest. Anger at injustice, real or perceived, causes regime change. You know, all that, all, think what's happening in the Ukraine at the moment. Delicate, delicate. So, it's just the thought that these are concepts worth downloading into ourselves. I think they're really helpful to understand the human being and to understand what's going on in the world, just as a model, if you like, not the only one, but as one. So there we are. Okay. Now, vanity. Right, this is fun. Vanity is good fun. Uh, so, uh, it's, this, this is a quotation from uh, Evagrius. Now, he is talking about vanity or vainglory, which is another expression, as it working in a monk. So you've got to go back, you're, you're sitting in the desert under a boiling sun in the 4th century, um, hoping for some grapes or whatever for lunch. And he says this, the spirit of vainglory is most subtle and it readily grows up in the souls of those who practice virtue people who are good. It leads them to desire to make their struggles known publicly. Um, to write their autobiography. Publish it. To hunt after the praise of men. It invents demons crying out, women being healed, and a crowd touching the garments. This is a monk fantasizing. And what he's fantasizing is that he, he's a very spiritual chap. And sooner or later this will be recognized. And people will start to flock to him. And he'll be a healer. And he'll be drive out de demons. And the crowd will be touching his garments. And he'll probably let his hair grow long and put on sandals to make himself look a little more like Jesus. <laughs> And the demon predicts, beside, that uh, he will attain to the priesthood. Now, because if you're a, uh, the two are quite different, being a monk and being a priest. You'll become a priest. It has, in, in his mind, it has men knocking on the door, seeking audience with him, looking for his advice. And saying, we, you know, you're so fantastic, we've got to make you a priest. Uh, and, oh, no, no, you mustn't do that. And so... He, he imagines, yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll go through that, but then they'll force him. They'll force him and they'll drag him off and they'll find a bishop and he'll be ordained. That kind of thing tended to happen. And when in this way he's carried aloft by vain hope, the demon vanishes, all these thoughts suddenly go away, and the monk is left to be tempted by the demons of pride or of sadness, which bring upon him thoughts opposed to his hopes. He realizes this hasn't happened yet. And sometimes it delivers him over to the demon of fornication, he who a little while before was, a, was imagining himself as a holy priest carried off in bonds. Well, that's quite realistic stuff, actually. And uh, it happens, you know, it happens. Now, that's, that's a monk in the desert, tempted by vanity, 
fantasizing. It's, you, you see, he's entering a fantasy world, and this is a key element of vanity. It's a fantasy world. Now, the, the, the words are, uh, in Greek, it's kenodoxia, which means empty glory or empty boasting. Hence the uh, English phrase, old-fashioned phrase, vain glory. Vain in the sense of empty, having no content. Glory meaning praise or fame or reputation. One dictionary definition for vain is having too much pride in one's appearance, achievements or possessions, being conceited. Now, um, the, 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 the old monk, monks distinguish two kinds of vanity. One is kind of lower level stuff. Um, and there is, of course, a desire in us to be appreciated, recognized, acknowledged and affirmed. And this is part of our being as social animals. It's actually rather a touching admission that we are dependent on others. We're so worried about what other people think of us uh, because we're not actually self-sufficient. We do, it does, um, we're not uh, a house with no doors or windows. So we need some kind of affirmation for our emotional and spiritual health. And as beings created in the image and likeness of God as religious animals, we need above all the recognition that God alone can give us. We need his endorsement, his love. And so this is a need to receive glory from God. How can you believe, Jesus says, who receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. And according to the same gospel, that's John 5:44, elsewhere, many authorities didn't dare confess their faith in Jesus for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. John 12:43. The praise of men or recognition from one another has its place. But if it's more than the praise of God, then we are in a disorder. So a child naturally looks for recognition from its parents or its teachers. You know, and if you preach a homily or something, you hope people are going to come up and say, Oh, that was fantastic, Father, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, and you're a bit disappointed if they don't. And, and then you know there are some, you know, who always will. So you kind of wander over to them and say, hello. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> so there it is. But vanity is this desire perverted or misdirected. We're seeking glory in things that are vain, that are empty, that have no content or it's therefore a kind of madness, actually, let's say. It's, it's not sane. It's not rational. So here are some definitions of, of, of vanity. These are sort of more modern ones. But an unhealthy craving for uncritical respect. <laughs> we recognize that, I think. The race for social visibility. The race for social visibility. Craving significance from others being enraptured by one's own image. That's narcissism. Vaunting our specialness. The pursuit of glamorous appearances. A pathetic plea for personal significance. That's rather touching. A personal plea for uh, personal significance. And now one of the ancient uh, Dorotheus of Gaza, he says it's a rag to cover our nakedness. Now that's, that's very, that's wonderful. Because now we, we know the story of um, you know Adam and Eve and uh, how after their sin they realized they were naked. Now there's one in, uh, interpretation of that, very strong in the, in the liturgical tradition and, and in the patristic tradition, is that 
they they were or they were vested and they before they weren't naked before the sin they weren't naked actually what they were clothed in was this robe of glory they were clothed in the recognition that god gave them in the affirmation of god and they turned away from god and lost that and so they were discovered that they were naked and so then they had to seek around you remember they, they well actually it's a very touching thing god himself makes them clothes then and that there's a these garments of skin and some of the fathers have a whole thing about garments of skin it's our mortality really but if you take the fact that that it at one level as fallen human beings we are naked and and that's a very you know that can be very embarrassing and difficult and so we're looking for rags to cover our nakedness and so we're looking for for silly little things to make us look good silly things rags that won't do uh, we're not looking for the glory that comes from God now yes and Jesus himself you remember is tempted to vain glory uh, we'll hear that on the first Sunday of Lent to throw himself down from the pinnacle of the temple be a spectacle be a spectacle uh, and then then he'd have everybody with him but no now there are two forms vanity as I said the, the lower one this is but that being proud or boastful about goods real or imaginary and desiring to be seen regarded admired respected honored praised even flattered by others so here we're dealing with kind of lower order goods my appearance uh, my skills my prowess in sport um, wealth possessions social status power intelligence knowledge um, skill any technical any technical ability or my skill with language or whatever it is all those things um, we, we can become fixated on and invest our identity on and that is vanity because these things are okay in their place they all have their place uh, but but uh, not if they usurp the place become the the primary thing also of course we can be vain about evil things so there's a kind of young man who's proud about how many women he's got to bed or whatever or or um, you know how many people you've beaten up or something like that uh, that's very um, serious but then there's this other kind which can afflict the the spiritual the desire John Cassian says for vain renown for hidden spiritual things to be thought of as holy and spiritual and charismatic um, now that is rather dangerous uh, and the whole spiritual life can be taken over by this and sapped of its substance and the, the further danger is that we believe the flattery we receive or we believe our own propaganda and we imagine that we have virtues that we don't and we fear, fail to see the vices that we do have um, I know there's one um, Benedictine lay movement where they've kind of reintroduced um, kind of the uh, fraternal correction and there's you you you're you're partnered with someone else and you sit down with them and they say to you one good quality they see in you uh, and one not so good one and it's quite a, would be quite a testing discipline you know you do this I don't know once a month or something you just sit down and, and this person will say well you know you're you're I don't know you're wonderfully patient or something but you are a bit whatever and it's probably something that you know we don't expect we don't think we would know and that we would actually find quite painful and embarrassing when we're confronted with it um, but 
we, we can be seduced by our own image and enter a fantasy world and it has such a grip that in the end uh, we don't need others to tell we're, us we're marvellous because we're so convinced that we are. And that's when you move into pride and that is really, really dangerous. You've had it then actually. Um, at least if you're dependent on others uh, to tell you that you're wonderful. That, that, that the, there's a bit of hope there, there's an opening because somebody might speak the ghastly truth. Um, now, and you know, it is true, isn't it? You know, vanity follows us wherever we go. So, um, <laughs> John Climacus um, says, is, uh, somewhere, well, got it here, it's rather good, but it, it's, um, when I fast, I am vain. When I hide my fasting and keep it secret. I am vain about my discretion. If I dress well, I am vain. But when I change into poor clothes, I'm even more vain. <laughs> if I speak, I am possessed by vanity. And if I observe silence, I'm once more given up to vanity. It's so true. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, Yes, I think Tolstoy had something about this, that, you, that every time you, you get a good thought, you get a good inspiration springs up and it, immediately this mirror appears and you say, oh, that's rather good, you know, there you are, that just shows I'm quite a chap actually, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and it spoils it. He says it's like, you know, it's like snow melting under the sun. Um, there it is, it's terrible. <laughs> it, I think it will accompany us all our life. Um, and yeah, what do you do? What do you do? But there's some images of it. It's like bindweed or ivy, and and it it wraps itself round our whole life. This vanity thing, doesn't it? I think that's true. It it wraps itself round. And sometimes, if you look at a tree covered in ivy, that uh, the, the ivy can be so strong and been there so long that it's actually killed the tree. There's nothing behind the tree. The, the, the tree is dead and there's just ivy. Uh, in other words, the substance is gone and we're just in a fantasy world. Uh, it's, it's rather that. The other image is of an onion. And because that goes back to what the, the thing about when I fast I'm vain and when I don't fast I'm vain. You know, uh, that, that it, it's just, you, you, you think, oh, I've got, I'll get rid of my vanity. And then, but then there's another layer. Well, I, well, I've got rid of my vanity, that's rather good. And so there's another layer, and then another layer, and another layer. It's an endless, eternal onion that you're carrying about with you. And it won't go away. There's another image is of, a, of a mouse at harvest time. And uh, it, the, the fathers say, you know, the demons get absolutely delighted when they see somebody becoming holy because then they say well we can really get him on vanity now and it's just like a mouse in harvest time and so there's all this beautiful beautiful wheat being harvested now this chap is is really you know racing towards God and so the little mouse of the, the, the mouse of vanity comes in and says wow I'm gonna have a great time here and that's it that's another and the other one in painting and so on is the lady with a mirror the lady with a mirror looking into the mirror uh, and admiring herself. Uh, and of course Narcissus on the edge of the, le of, the, of the pool, gazing in until he falls in and drowns. What is a therapy? What is a therapy? Well, I think, again, they would, uh, these wise men will always say, the great thing is to be at least, to some extent, conscious of it, be aware of it. Um, name the demon and also be aware of how silly it is because I mean it's got a it's got a humorous side to it vanity it's just a bit ridiculous uh, and to see that and to be able to laugh at it I mean we, we it's, it's funny in other people it is funny when we see it in other people that the, the, their vanity their little vanities the, the things the impressions they like to give the way they like to show off and so on and I think if you think of it as a passenger in a car, you know, you're not going to get rid of it. 
It's always going to be beside you in the car, wherever you go. The great thing is not to let it hold the wheel. Uh, if, if, you, if you stop the car and chuck it out, he'll just, cl you know, he'll get in the back door or he'll, you'll find he's in the boot or whatever. But, the, but regard it as a, uh, as a passenger and keep it as a passenger and just live with it, really. There's a story, I think, of St. Bernard uh, and he was going up, he was going up a pulpit to preach and um, he thought, you know, this is going to be a pretty good sermon, actually. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, he said, you know, I'm pretty good at this anyway, he was thinking, and this is going to be a really good one, and everybody... And then he thought, oh my goodness, you know, I'm thinking that, what can I do? I'd better come down. Uh, but God said, no, 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 just go up and preach the sermon, and live with that vanity, but keep it in the passenger seat. Live with it, just do what you, do what you have to do, do your duty, and put up with this, this, uh, this little thing whispering in your ear. But don't give in to it and try and accept graciously what punctures it. And be grateful to those who are not part of the personal fan club. Um, they, they say, think of them as doctors sent to you by Christ. They're doctors sent by Christ. The people who tell you what a, what a shocker and what a washout you are. One poor priest in the, in the diocese was told the other day by someone in his parish council, oh, the, the priest who, um, who'd been in the parish before, he talked you up so much, talked you up so much. In other words, now you've come, you're such a disappointment. <laughs> you know, what a thing to say. Anyway, anyway, he's a, he's a sort of holy man, so he took it. But there you are. Um, and, and, of course, if we're... The sign, if we're devastated by criticism, it's a, a sign that we're still enchained to praise, isn't it? Really. <laughs> but try and, well, one has to try and consider oneself a useless servant. Seek for the glory that comes from God. And think of the judgment of God. The, tomorrow's second reading, tonight's second reading already from St. Paul is about that. Um, even if my conscience acquits me, he says, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I've got to wait for the judgment of God. There's only one ultimate true judgment of us which comes from God. And so we await for that. But I think the uh, great thing is reality. You know, vanity is illusion, essentially. And so the more reality any kind of reality that we can get into our lives, the better. Real love drives out vanity. Love of neighbour makes us indifferent to glory, says Maximus the Confessor. If we really love other people, then, then vanity kind of dissipates. It's not relevant to any situation in which we are. Um, all of that. And then Evagrius says, of course, prayer, that if we really, if in prayer we really meet God and, and have a sense of his presence, uh, yeah, his, his closeness, his, his recognition of us, uh, his eyes upon us, then what other people are, are saying or our need for the constant affirmation of others will die down, will diminish, diminish. I think when we know that divinely and humanly that we're really loved, then we don't need to be looking for this ersatz thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So, so that's, um, that's vanity. Sorry that there, there are two tonight, but uh, we'll, we'll, if we just move on to pride and then um, now this is something I mean not everybody distinguishes vanity and pride and often we don't in common common speech they're the same thing really but um, the good uh, come in there should be a chair somewhere um, 
and, and it, it's, it's like the difference from being a, someone young to being someone grown up because there is still something rather touching and human about vanity as I said there's something slightly amusing and uh, about it uh, but with pride uh, pride's not a joke not real pride is not a joke at all and this is what Evagrius says about it the demon of pride is the cause of the most damaging fall of the soul for it induces the monk to deny that God is his helper and to consider that he himself is the cause of virtuous actions. Mm. Further, he gets a swollen head in regard to the brethren, the other monks, considering them stupid because they do not all have the same opinion of him. Now, you see, when we're vain, we are dependent on the opinion of others. But then, as I say, we convince ourselves we've believed our own propaganda and we are quite sure that we are special. And if someone doesn't recognize it, well, that's, you know, that's their loss, really. Uh, it's their fault. And then anger and sadness come following on the heels of this demon. And last of all, comes in its wake the greatest of maladies, derangement of mind, madness, and a multitude of demons in the air. Now that sounds a bit, but the, the person goes psychotic. Let's put that in modern words. That pride leads to psychosis. That's what is being said there. Now the classic definition is from St. Augustine. Inordinate love, inordinate love of one's own excellence. Another might be an exaggerated opinion of oneself leading to disdain for others and even contempt for God. Now there is of course a legitimate and positive and proper pride. There's a rightful self-respect or self-esteem. I think ideally, I won't ask any husbands and wives here, but ideally a husband and wife should be proud of each other. Uh, and we can be proud of our nationality or, or our university or our friends or our company even or our profession. We can be proud to be a Catholic. Now that's using the word in a positive sense or at least a harmless sense. It's a recognition of goodness including in oneself uh, and that is a virtue. It's always good to recognize goodness. But here we're interested in the vice or the passion of pride, pride in the pejorative sense. Now we have a very high calling as human beings, far higher than we realize. We are called to know, love and serve God and be united with him forever in glory. We are called to be excellent in that sense. And pride in the negative sense is getting the locus of that excellence wrong or the, the locus or the focus of it wrong. Now the image of pride, the language of pride suggests first of all a being above or being high. So hupephania in Greek which means being up. Uh, there's some debate about the etymology of that word but certainly the, the, the hooper bit, the hyper bit is, means being up. And similarly the Latin word, you know the Latin word for pride, superbia, Super means being up, up, on high. And the English word proud, this is a very interesting thing, uh, the etymology of, of proud and pride. And uh, I don't know if any of you know the Bayer Tapestry, uh, yeah, which, which is this wonderful tapestry of the Battle of Hastings in 1066 with the Normans uh, fighting, uh, <laughs> fighting the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, and, and unhappily defeating them. And uh, the Normans are all on horseback and the Anglo-Saxons are all on foot. And uh, the, the, the word, the, the, the French word, the old French word, there was an old French word for brave or valiant, prude, I think, which became pre. Does that exist? Pre, a bit poetic and old-fashioned, which, which would mean brave or valiant and would be used of 
as it were, the people round a king, the knights, the retainers. And so there all these Normans came over the channel on their horses and these poor old Saxons, little Saxons, hobbits, <laughs> sort of chomping along. And then these, these, you know, these sort of dark riders, these Normans came along. And, and you know, they said, well, who are you? Oh, we are Preux. We are the Preux. You would say, we are Preux. And they said, proud. Yeah, okay, you're proud. Yeah, you sure are proud. <laughs> and so that is where, that, this is one theory, that this is where the, 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 the English word proud took on this meaning of arrogance. It's being on horseback. You know, it's the people, it, 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 it's being on a high horse, on your high horse. There we are. Or it's like, you know, those pictures of, you know, people in panzers and so on, you know, and the poor civilians all around. Um, there it is. So, now the English word haughty. That comes in here at all, because that's from French O, oh, and Latin altus means, again, being high. So pride is a lifting up of oneself, of the heart. Acting with a high hand is a biblical phrase. Refusing our commonality with others and our dependence on God. Refusing to accept the status of being God's creature. Refusing to be an earthling, humble. As we know, the word humble comes from the word for earth, humus, humus. So, you're, you've got, so the Saxons were humble because they had their feet on the earth. The Normans were proud because they were up on their, up on their, up on their horses. And uh, the words for human, humour and humility, humble, are all etymologically related. So humanity, humour, and humility go together and are the opposite of pride. How will one who is dirt and dust be proud, asks the book of Sirach. But pride comes before a fall. Anyway, then arrogance, that's another word, arrogance. That means to claim, to ask towards yourself, to bring things to you. So here it's not a question of pride being on top, but pride you're in the centre. In other words, we see ourselves as the centre of the universe with everyone and everything else, a planet to the shining sun that is me. There it is. Uh, pride is the focus on oneself tending to its ultimate extreme, determining our every thought, word and action. Everything is referred to the self. Every sentence, metaphorically speaking, begins with I, the first person singular. So the Pharisee in Jesus' story of the two men praying in the temple says, God, I thank thee that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. He's on the border between vanity and pride, this man. He's still, at least he's still talking to God, but really his prayer is an exercise in self-congratulation. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the proud man imposes himself upon the attention, time and energy of all around him. He becomes impudent and brazen. His own affairs are important. Other people's concerns are of no consequence. He undertakes everything, interferes everywhere. You know, little Hitlers, even in the office and so forth. St. Benedict uh, speaks of monks being swollen with pride, you see, inflated, pumped up. So pride is a kind of spiritual obesity or elephantiasis. The proud man fills the space, takes over, crams out others. Pride is an inhuman desire for independence. It's the ultimate declaration of independence. <laughs> Forgive me there, but anyway, it's the ultimate declaration <laughs> of independence. It, it, is, uh, uh, it is a self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency, it tends to isolation, to inner darkness, to a frozen heart, to a frozen heart. Uh, Max Scheler, great German philosopher, ended up very much with a philosophy of his own at the end of his life, said, my heart, my heart is like a lump of ice within me. 
the end of his life. It builds a bronze wall between ourselves and God. It can lead to hatred for God, says the Catechism. It separates us from others. And here's one writer on it. Rendered incapable through pride of turning towards God or opening himself genuinely to, to his neighbour, man turns back on himself. He encloses himself in the limited universe of his ego. In all his reactions, he remains imprisoned within himself. Pride thus appears as a denial of charity, and so initiates the destruction of all the harmonious relationships which charity makes possible with God and in God with the self and neighbour. God has given man a capacity for love so that he can be united to him. The proud person perverts this. He turns it from its natural finality and focuses it on himself. The proud person loves his ego and nothing else. Well, that is really hell. That is hell. And, and uh, if people say, well, there's no such thing as hell, well, I don't know. I mean, because, because I, I, I could imagine that. For myself, I could imagine that. Newman says somewhere, well, you can't imagine dear old Aunt Bertha going to hell, you know, but just think of yourself. Just think of yourself. Uh, you could love, you could f fall in love with your own ego to that extent that you don't really want anyone else around. Um, and that's, that's an unhappy state. Pride is self-love rampant. Pride does not have a happy ending. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. According to the Bible, the proud person will be the victim of his own excess, abandoned by his friends and opposed by God. It is strange how often dictators end in holes or bunkers. Underground, away from the light and away from natural human intercourse. Hitler, his bunker, Mao had a whole underground place where he lived that nobody could get into, and just him and a handful of people. And that's where he lived. No natural light. Very strange. And then Saddam Hussein, you remember those pictures? He was found in a hole. It's extraordinarily symbolic, that. It's terribly powerful. So, this is from... Um, Russian writer, this is, this is wonderful, I think. Anyway, the proud suffers defeat on all fronts. Psychologically, he suffers from melancholy, darkness, sterility. Morally, from solitude, the withering of love, malice. Theologically, from a death of the soul and preceding physical death, from hell during this present life. Physiologically and pathologically, from nervous and mental sickness. This is, this is putting it melodramatically and in its extreme forms, taken, taken to the end. But uh, m much of what mentioned, um, we're getting towards the end, fear not, um, is summed up though in a stirring passage of Isaiah chapter 14. Uh, this is referring to the king of Babylon and you'll see it, it has all sorts of resonance. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly on the heights of Zaphon. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who would not let his prisoners go home? All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. But you are cast out, away from your grave, like loathsome carrion clothed with the dead, those pierced by the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a corpse tram trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial, 
because you have destroyed your land. You have killed your people. That's the end of the megalomaniac dictator, really. And I mean, how many times in the 20th century has that not been verified, actually? So, um, it re this reminds us of how the whole Bible story is shot through with pride. It's a battle between the proud and the humble. Mary is the cantor of the victory of the humble. He has scattered the proud of heart and exalted the lowly. Behind all the human sin of history lurks an angelic sin, that of Lucifer, and the fall of the angels who sided with him. This, si this sin is often attributed to pride, and that passage of Isaiah is used to describe it. Now, the Catechism speaks of the created spirits, angels, who radically and irrevocably rejected God and his reign. The first human sin is a kind of replay of this, brought about by Satan. The Catechism does not directly call the first sin one of pride, though many uh, theologians have, but lack of trust and disobedience. But then it says, in that sin, man preferred himself to God, and by that very act scorned him. He chose himself over and against God, against the requirements of his creaturely status, and therefore against his own good. Constituted in a state of holiness, man was destined to be fully divinized by God in glory. Seduced by the devil, he wanted to be like God, but without God, before God, and not in accordance with God. The Bible is aware of how pride can seize the wealthy and rulers, nations, empires. Biblical history is at one level a succession of proud, swaggering, destructive corporates. Assyria, Babylon, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans and others. The people of Israel themselves are often stiff-necked, have proud hearts and haughty eyes. In the Bible, pride is more than merely individual, it is also demonic social and political. And against all this lifting up of self comes the great descent of Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of slay, a slave, and was humbler, yet even to death, death on a cross. Therefore God has exalted him. Therefore God has exalted him. And Mary rejoices in being the lowly handmaid of the Lord. Now, I'd just like to end. This is, I think, quite a, a, quite a deep point. But Evagrius and Cassian and the monastic fathers see the worst kind of pride as that which refuses to acknowledge grace. I once uh, met a chap who'd uh, spent some time on Mount Athos. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, some pretty interesting things go on there if you're... Uh, a student of human nature, shall we say. And um, the, the, the were, he, he said, the, he, he knew two cases where the monk, it's exactly, exactly what Avagris said, they were utterly convinced of their own holiness and, uh, and were seeing visions of, of you know, of, of Mary and the saints and so on. She, it was sheer fantasy. And was standing by the window with another monk, and you know, if you've seen pictures of Mount Athos, you've got this sheer drop. And so, and these ramshackle monasteries sort of teetering on the edge. And here's this mad monk on the edge, and, and saying, no, here is, the, the mother of God is coming to, to take me to heaven, you know, I'm, I'm ready to be assumed into heaven. And his brethren are saying, well, no, we, you know, we don't think it's quite like that. <laughs> and, 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 but he said, oh yes, and he stepped out of the window and went down. It, it, it's, uh, and it's exactly what that, that it leads to, it, le it makes you mad. Pride is a madness and it makes you mad. And that's the sort of religious form of it, but I'm sure it takes other forms. But the worst kind of pride is that which refuses to acknowledge grace. The pride proper to the spiritual person is that of attributing his virtue or holiness or charisms to himself, to his own efforts, regarding them as his own achievement. So Evagrius tells the monk, remember the mercy of Christ. Now I think that's wonderful. Because what is pride? 
pride is the failure to see our need for the mercy of Christ. If you want a simple definition of pride. But we don't, we, we don't think we need the mercy of Christ. And humility is the remedy for pride. What is humility? Knowing that I need the mercy of Christ. So the tax collector in Jesus' story prays, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And he goes home justified. So I think somehow that's the key, that mercy of Christ. So, one last quotation. This is from a Russian writer. I think this is, this is a, I think, this is an absolutely wonderful passage. In conclusion, because I've been stressing, you know, pride. It's always more fun talking about vices and so on. But in, in, in conclusion, we naturally ask ourselves, how should we fight against this disease? So he says, pride is overcome by humility. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of we can all trot that out. But then what is that? By obedience to objective truth. An obedience undertaken in gradual stages. Obedience to those we love, in other words, or you could just say those immediately around us. To the laws of this world, I don't think that necessarily means the traffic laws mm. things, but the way things are. To objective truth, to beauty, that's lovely, to be obedient to beauty, to all that is good in us and outside obedience to God's teaching, and finally, obedience to the church, to her commandments, to her sacramental life. Now, that, you, could, you could spend a lot of time on that little passage. Some wonderful wisdom there. And in order to achieve this humility and obedience, we must undertake what stands first on the Christian way. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Man must deny himself, deny himself every day. Man must take up his cross daily. The cross of patiently accepting grievances, choosing the last place, bearing sorrows and illness, the silent acceptance of insults, of full unreserved obedience, immediate, voluntary, joyful, fearless and constant. Then he will find the way to the realm of peace of that deepest humility which destroys all passions. There we are. <laughs> um, so I don't know if anybody has any comments. <laughs> Simon. <laughs> uh, vanity. Yeah. Oh. Besides the importance of um, recognizing like, some of pride in ourselves, um, what, what if we know someone whom, whom we feel is, 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 is prideful? Should, oh. should, should we just pray for that? How can we pray for that person without taking the focus off too much of our own need for inner conversion? Um, well, it's always good to pray for other people, isn't it? And uh, N uh, New Newman says... Actually, Newman says a very interesting thing in a, in, a, in a sermon on intercession, that intercessory prayer, prayer for others, is, is, the, dis is the distinctively Christian form of prayer. It's, it's the prayer that flows from being redeemed and, and assimilated to Christ. So in one sense, so far as we're sinners and we're not redeemed, we have to pray for ourselves. But so far as we are in Christ... Uh, then we want to share in his intercession and we can pray for anyone and everyone. We had that this morning in the letter of St. James, really, telling you, saying pray, pray for the sick, pray for, you know. Uh, so, so I think we're allowed to do both, really. Um, but just, but 
Adam was saying, which is like to prove the person, but just to keep in mind that one needs conversion. Yes, 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 yes. I don't want to just be praying for that person. Yes, like, yes, that yes. Person. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you can uh, devote an awful lot of energy praying for someone's conversion when actually it's oneself that you know, needs one at least as much. Uh, that is true. Um, but I don't know, you just have to keep both things in mind. Or we, it, you know, it's a bit like a pendulum, isn't it? It swings, you know, we swing from side to side and sometimes we're focused on others and rightly and other times we need to be focused on ourselves and so forth. And we just hope the Holy Spirit helps us get it right. Mm. Question is this: uh, To what extent do you emphasize or stress your achievements because or recommendation before it becomes a pride? You know? Yeah, so yeah. It, it's. I mean, th there's been such a cultural shift uh, in my own lifetime on this point, uh, and and there's a difference between. Well, it used to be said difference between, say, the British approach and the Mediterranean approach, or British approach and the American approach. Uh, you know, if if you were um, if you're an old school Brit, you'd be asked, well, do you, you know, um, someone like, supposing you're, you're an absolutely fantastic tennis player, and, and somebody asks you, you know, do you play tennis? And you say, oh, well, I can knock a ball around a bit. Or something. <laughs> you wouldn't say anything. And then, uh, but then if, if you asked a Spaniard or an Italian, you know, do you play tennis? And he'd be utterly hopeless. I, I am brilliant. I am <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I think human culture. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, in, that might be my therapist tells me I'm very good. <laughs> so, so <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, it's <laughs> so, so. But it it is. I, I mean, I I find it. You know, um, the, you know, it's all Carl Rogers, isn't it? And all this stuff. You, that, you, that now when people come for interviews and everything, that, that you, you've got to sell yourself and tell you, and, and t you know, I, my administrative skills are of the highest. My thing. Well, I mean, I just don't believe it. <laughs> you know, you're sitting there and you think, well, I'm sorry. I don't, you know, could, if, if you just say something, well, actually, I'm not so good at this, or, you know, my desk is always a total mess, or, <laughs> or I'm usually late for appointments, you know, you think, well, you can have the job, you know. <laughs> and, and the, the, I just, oh, gosh, I, I can't stand it. Anyway, but, um, yeah, it's a fine line, isn't it? And, and it, it's, you know... It, I suppose culture and convention come into it, um, but uh, yeah, I mean it is it is it is not good to go around saying you know I'm a worm and no man. I mean there's uh, uh, that and, and you know the people suffer from a lack of self-esteem nowadays and all of this, and people are very isolated and very fragile, and so people do you know we. People do need affirmation and all of that, and and it's good for people to be aware of their good qualities. But what is it? St. Paul says, you know, we should. Yeah, you can be aware of your own gifts, but think soberly of them. You know, don't get drunk on your own. And that they are gifts. And that they are gifts. That's the that's the other thing. They are gifts. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, I don't think there's a magic. You know, there's a magic formula just because there's so much variety among human beings, you know, in different cultures and societies and periods of history. But I, I think one would know, you know, we're meant to be, you know, with, with the light of the Holy Spirit within us and this kind of thing. We're able to discern. We should be able to discern when we cross the line. Yeah, because why I ask that, you know, because for me it kind of conflicts with self-confidence. Like when mm. you have a self, low self-esteem and you're mm. trying to overcome that, yeah. that's a therapy to overcome it. By yes. the time you know it, you probably overstep the boundary of trying to build your self-confidence. Yes, to yeah. an ego and... You know, yes, yeah. Right. I mean, being a human is pretty impossible. You know, you've got to realize that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite something. Uh, it's not easy to get it right, being a human being. Uh, <laughs> uh, so... 
Mm. I think it's one of the things that it's where it leads you into, for example, pride and a sense yes. of entitlement. Yes. And, you know, the outcome of that and everything that goes with that. You know. Yes. And, yeah. and I, I, of course, uh, you see, it's, it's, it's the difference between patriotism and nationalism. And that was, uh, uh, you know, nationalism is, is a, uh, the, the, you know, which is, it, it beca the nation became God. I mean, this was all, th th this happened, you know, in the 19th century, 20th century, the nation became God and the blood that was shed because of that, you know, Deutschland über alles and all this, this sort of stuff. And it's, it's been hugely, patriotism is a virtue. Love of your country is right, but worship of your country isn't right. Somebody uh, once put it like you, uh, you love your mother and it's quite, and it can be quite natural for, you know, if you've been lucky with your mother to think, well, I had the best mother in the world, you know, and that, that's okay to think that, but you don't go round insulting other people's mothers. <laughs> and, and, that's the, and that's the difference between patriotism and nationalism. And it, it, that you don't do down other... And so I think that comes back to your... that you can say, yes, I've got gifts, but are you as eager to recognise them in others? Or, or do you feel the only way you can do that is by pouring a little bit of cold water, a little bit, a few drops of acid on on anyone else's achievements, you know. Yeah, it's funny business. Arpad. Can we say that uh, all the other uh, sins have some sort of uh, touch or a hint of uh, this pride? For instance, if you say, let's consider uh, envy, then uh, maybe somehow... Oh, you, oh, there's pride in it. <laughs> yes, deserve, yes. I deserve uh, that thing better, or gluttony. I deserve that slice of cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> entitlement. <laughs> yeah, entitlement, yes. Advertisers <laughs> play quite often it's for you because you deserve it. Yes, I suppose so. Yes, I think so. Well, it's interesting. You see, if they, um, you see, uh, Evagris, and then it, it, this is developed much more by St. Maximus the Confessor. Uh, Evagri, uh, th they say that the root, the, 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 our root disorder where is, is self-love. In other words, the wrong kind of self-love. And inordinate, as the, that's, it's a useful word, it's kind of old-fashioned word, but it's, it's a useful word, out of order. Uh, um, out that all these things, gluttony and lust and avarice and whatnot, are are all symptoms of uh, inordinate self-love. And then Avagra says, and the worst one, and the last one, and the most destructive one is pride. Then, when you go into what he's saying about pride, it's pretty similar to 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 inordinate self-love. I mean, that's almost a definition of it. And so Gregory the Great, uh, he takes pride out of the list and puts it at the top uh, or as the origin of it and that's where and that's where you bring in the story of the f Lucifer and the story of the fall and so the, the original sin of the angels and the original sin of, hu of humanity is pride and out of it comes and pride therefore comes into all the, which is what you're saying I suppose so yeah. that's the sort of academic answer to it uh, but that certainly Gregory the Great would agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Luke. Just make a comment about how pride may affect um, some scientific and human inquiry in the relationship between sort of atheism, people that move away from belief in God because of human... Mm, are they proud? Discovery. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah. It seems like there's some relationship between turning away from God or whatever. Yes, it's yes. Pride and atheism. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think... Yeah, yes, I mean, uh, you, you know, you can never do that. You can meet some very humble atheists, genuinely humble atheists. Um, and it, one, one, could never, one could never say it of um, any individual human being. We're not entitled to do that, really. Um, but whether the phenomenon of atheism can be connected with pride. You see, if you understand, 
pride uh, as isolation and individualism carried to an extreme, then there would be a link with atheism. I mean, they, I mean, the the monastic fathers clearly say that you 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 can dis the monk who who falls victim to this, it effectively can dispense himself from God. So there's a practical atheism there. Not a theoretical atheism, but a practical atheism. And, and uh, so, I mean, I think one would have to say there's a link, actually. I mean, from the point of view of the spiritual battle and all of that. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to get to a point that I think it would be underhanded, an underhanded, that you, that, uh, pride, you're falling victim to pride in some way. But I just wanted to be kind of specific, actually, about we make significant scientific advances in yeah. a couple hundred years. Yes. Ah, uh, yes, yes. The the, idea of, that that and leads and to I pride. I, I like to, I, I, I follow science a fair amount of it. I found it fantastic. But I'm just wondering if that yes. in itself can pull us away because there's such a... Yes. A yes, yes, I think so. I think, I think uh, you know, you could, you could certainly, modern man is proud of his, of his technological achievements and you know, there's Prometheus in it all and got the fire from heaven and we can do anything we like now. Uh, all of that. And that is pride. Yes, that is. And, and uh, th this is where the, uh, you know, where the West is completely flummoxed by Islam, actually. And Islam means submission. Um, and, and, uh, and the liberal, the li liberal West is, is cannot get his head round Islam. That's, I mean, you could uh, anyway. But that's something. But yes, I think so. I think we'd have to. I mean, any, you know, it's like gay pride and all this sort of stuff. I mean, it, you know, any any culture, any country, any. I mean, the nineteenth century was were, Europeans were unbelievably proud. Unbelievably, uh, and, and there's no doubt about it. Uh, and and I think different, you know. I think nations, you know, they rise and fall, and they come to a point, they reach a certain height, and they are full of pride, and then hubris and ne nemesis kicks in, and down they tumble. You know, one could name some nations that might be going that way, but there it is.